Clark from the military panel. Um, I'm Cleo Gatsu Davis. I will be moderating for you today. And here we have Daniel Gomez and Ryan Hart. Uh, do you all want to say a little bit to introduce yourselves before we get started? With sure. Uh, hey guys, I'm Dan Gomez. I'm CEO and founder of First Person Experience. We're an experience design company. Uh, we started last year and we're out of New York City. Um, I'm also a major in the United States Army Reserves, uh, and I'm an instructor at the Special Warfare, the John F. Kennedy Special Warfare Center School at Fort Bragg. Um, so my job is to, for my Army job is to design scenarios to evaluate and train um, our future Special Operations soldiers. Uh, my name is Ryan Hart. I think I know most of you guys. So <laughs> I'll keep it brief. Uh, I was a, I. I am a pilot, formerly in the Air Force. Uh, I did 12 years active duty. I uh, just recommissioned as a major, once again, in the Air National Guard. Uh, I consider myself by trade a C-5 pilot. That's a really big one with the nose that comes up in front, if you've seen that. And then I also flew MC-12s, and uh, I am going to go fly Predators uh, now, which is kind of the MC-12 without a pilot in it, which is much nicer, because instead of flying them out of Afghanistan, I get to fly out of upstate New York. So. <laughs> yeah, it's better. And a little bit, uh, the per diem's a little bit better, so. <laughs> Not too many people got that one, but I try. Those are jokes. <laughs> okay, yeah, inside, inside yeah. Uh, military jokes. <laughs> yes. okay, cool, so the way the structure here is gonna work, um, is that we're gonna have both presentations and at the end we'll have time for audience questions and comments and whatnot and we're gonna start with you, Dan. Oh, so yeah, let me take There's no clicker, so you're yeah. gonna just gonna use the manual arrows. click. Manual click. So it's so awesome for me to sit with you guys today and explain to, uh, to you guys how the US military uses the different aspects of LARP, LARPing, um, to train its soldiers. Now, and, um, I'm speaking on behalf of myself, as a member of the Armed Forces, I'm not talking for the Army, but um, we're going to share, uh, you're going to notice there's a lot of similarities in what we do uh, to train soldiers versus what I did yesterday in being a vampire, right? It's, it's almost the exact same thing, and I, thought, I think the, the similarities are pretty amazing. Um, so just a quick, uh, just a quick note, um, our presentation just has some pictures of real soldiers engaged in simulated combat. So in no way will I be talking about Real stuff, it's all make-believe, right? Um, but just so you know, uh, we're going to be talking about those types of situations, casualties, things like, th things like that, all right? So viewer discretion is advised, all right? And now that that's taken care of, we can go into war stories, right? So let me tell you about uh, a story. So there was a 10-man a, a team of uh, Special Operations soldiers, and they were visiting a local village leader uh, in the country of Pineland. And uh, they went, they're in these armored vehicles right here, these are called MRAPs. Um, there were also some Humvees in there as well. And they were dispersed among the vehicles, you know, fully loaded. You know, each vehicle has a crew surf weapon, and they all have their own personal weapons and everything like that. And they're going into a pretty dangerous situation. Uh, but the object, of the, the purpose of this meeting with this local village leader is to uh, help them identify security concerns in the area and then to help them mitigate those concerns by offering additional patrols in the area and things like that. So they, they had a great meeting with the, the local leader. They uh, exchanged pleasantries, they got down to business, they drank tea, and everything was well and good. As the soldiers were leaving, though, they were engaged by small arms fire uh, from the rooftops. The soldiers returned fire and then escaped in their vehicles uh, back to base. So they returned fire, bad guys got away, and they returned to base. In route back to base, they were hit by an IED, an improvised explosive device, that um, damaged one of their trucks. But they did a quick check with each other, and they just kept moving out, right? There's no reason to stop. Exploded, they keep moving. Uh, as they approached the base, the Patrol leader, uh, Captain Garcia, tells the driver to stop the truck. The tr driver should stop the truck. He says, I think I'm hit, and he's bleeding from his left side. He grabs the left side, opens the truck door, and falls out of it. The driver stands there frozen with his hands on the wheel, while the gunner in the vehicle is like, hey, what's wrong with that guy? The driver says, I don't know. 
The gunner's like, well, check on him, right? And the driver says, I can't, I'm driving. And that's where our story begins, right? So I'm going to leave that on a cliffhanger, and we'll talk about what actually happened. Now, that whole situation and story I told you was in a simulated combat environment. It was in a training center in Fort Bragg. It didn't really happen. There wasn't really an explosion. There wasn't really soldiers. The soldiers were participating in that exercise, and that whole thing happened um, to them. But you know, of course, nobody's actually bleeding or anything like that. Um, so that's all. Those similarities between that, what happened there, and that patrol has a lot of similarities with what happens in LARP. So as uh, as I'm going to break down to you is talk about how the army uses LARP. Um, how, why, why do we use LARP, and what goals do we meet by using LARP, what are the types of LARP that armies, the, the Army does, and what are some of the basic concepts that I see as uh, LARP designers that you can use from what we do, all right? So that's how we're going to break it down. So why LARP? Uh, LARP stands for Live Action Role Playing, right? Um, the United States Army does a lot of roles in its work. Uh, here, just top left picture is just one of those Humvees in, a, in Iraq doing a security patrol. Top right, you have a vehicle, and they were doing um, rescuing people from Hurricane Harvey. So it's disaster relief and humanitarian assistance. On the bottom left is uh, soldiers on the border uh, assisting the, the border guard doing surveillance. And on the bottom right is um, soldiers conducting foreign internal defense, which they're helping train other nations' militaries so that they can deal with um, the insurgencies and help decrease violence in their, in their own countries. These are all completely different roles that fit under the category of the soldier. So wouldn't it make sense to, as we train soldiers in these roles, that we have some live action role playing of that, of those roles, right? So that's why, uh, why we could use LARP and why we do use LARP in some situations in the Army. Um, so what's the goal? There's a big difference in muscle memory and critical thinking, as we all understand. When people think about the Army, they usually think about the infantry soldier, right? The soldier with body armor and a weapon. Um, his job is to close with and destroy the enemy by means of small arms fire. That's just the mission of the infantry. Um, the, what they need to understand with their training is muscle memory. They need to be able to react instinctively, quickly, and they make split-second decisions that their lives depend on, right? Um, so they need to train for muscle memory. So when we're designing a training event for them, we're not thinking about uh, political grievances and concerns of the populace and um, logistical effects and things like that. We want to help this soldier put them in a situation where they have to execute this muscle memory as quickly as possible and then turn it back off. Turn it back on and turn it back off, right? Um, so that's, if your goal is that, you design differently than if you want to do this, the scenario picture on the right, which is critical thinking. Here we have two soldiers in the US Embassy talking with the defense attache, who's the senior military official for that embassy, and they're in charge of like basically um, political discourse and mil political and military discourse with that country's um, military. Both of these are soldiers, but the one on, the, the one on the, your right, they need to think of second and third order effects. They need to control their language. They need to control, like, um, be aware of political landmines, right? Talking about things that don't affect the country negatively. Making sure that um, the US mission is basically one line, but the policies are all in line together, right? So for example, if our policy is to deal with climate change, the soldiers, if they don't believe in climate change, they can't say that, right? They have to be, put, um, they have to toe the party line in that and discuss that the, the same way. So the scenario on the right, that situation, they'll be able to train to that effect, okay? So basically, you have to understand what's your goal when designing a LARP, and the military does that. They understand which, how can we design our training to meet each of these separate requirements. Um, now, in my case, I work at the Special Operations Center. We evaluate and train highly specialized adaptive thinking Special Operations soldiers to deploy to austere locations 
in permissive or hostile environments uh, to do the job that we send them to do, basically. Right? Um, this requires an exceptional amount of critical thinking, and not everybody can do this. This is why it's a highly selective process that lasts years um, to help get these soldiers to see if they are capable of doing it, to train them, and then put them out and actually have them do missions. So if our goal is to train these type of individuals, um, how can we do that? How can we put them in an ad adaptive situation um, that simulates permissive and hostile environments, right? We send, um, when our students graduate our course, they can literally be two pe a two-man mission in the Indonesian embassy working on disaster relief for a recent uh, volcano eruption. Or it could be a four-man team in the middle of Nigeria talking with a warlord, uh, talking with a warlord to get them to stop human, human trafficking um, Boko Haram victims, right? Both, I literally had soldiers deployed in both those regions right after they graduated. So how do we create the dynamic to train them and test them to see if they're capable of operating in this area? You can't just take a test, right? Discuss political grievances, Shaq. You cannot do that. You need something more dynamic, and that's why we used um, live action role playing and training. So, um, the Army does not define this at all in the way I'm defining it, but um, we understand that there's nuance in that. The military uses different types of LARPs for different reasons. So, there's situational LARPs, which just cover a specific instance um, where it's a very canned event. Uh, that's just for one purpose. This picture is a um, sexual harassment and assault response program initiative where soldiers get together and they discuss uh, how we are one team in one fight and that you know, sexual uh, harassment and assault is not tolerated and everything like that. However, in this case, it's led by a facilitator, and instead of doing our normal online quarterly training that we do, we actually um, role play in this, and they discuss different um, situations, and they ask soldiers what they think, and the legal expert talks, and then the commander talks, and things like that. So they work through these issues in order to train our soldiers to be, to be better at, at their job. Um, other types of situational LARPs would be um, small one-day uh, events that deal with um, a specific task. For example, we have a, an airborne unit that conducts aerial uh, insertion operations where they get all their gear, get loaded up on an aircraft, and get deployed over a, um, an airfield. And their job is to conduct their military maneuvers to seize that airfield for follow-on forces. Uh, this, if they're going to do something like that, usually it involves very minimal story, very minimal narrative and things like that. It's bottom line, when the private asks, what are we doing? You're seizing an airfield. That's it. They don't have a, they don't need, um, we don't need to create all the fiction about the area or pretend it's somewhere else or anything like that. We're seizing Luzon Airfield, 0300 tomorrow, jumping out of aircraft to do it. You organize with your squad and execute. So this isn't like, um, it's not dynamic, right? It, you're doing a little, you're jumping on aircraft, you're loading weapons, you're doing all this stuff, but you're not, it's not story-based or anything like that. So those are the situation LARPs. The live action LARP is something that's very unique to special operations and other things. This is when soldiers go to a place such as the National Training Center in Fort Irwin or the Joint Readiness Training Center in uh, Fort Polk, Louisiana and they conduct a multi-day, multi-week exercise fighting fictional enemies in fictional countries. Um, some of our famous enemies are like the Atropians, and we always say no U.S. blood for Atropian oil and things like that, right? Um, and they, we create this interesting dynamic where they have to do a full deployment of all of their gear into this fictional country and then execute combat operations against a fictional enemy in that, in that area. Um, we have graders in that, and we have observers, and we have all these different moving pieces with that. Uh, very expensive, multi-billion dollar operations. For my, for close to home to me in, in Fort Bragg, we do another type of evaluation where it's a live action event. 
Our soldiers deploy to the same fictional country called Pineland. They have extraordinary political situations and dynamics with over 80 different characters with very deep historic context with those characters. And after the soldiers meet these individuals over a course of missions for a couple days, we turn it into the live action portion. And then from then on, whatever the students do and plan is free form. So the student says, I want to go to this water treatment plant to meet with this engineer to discuss the water issues. Behind the scenes, magically, we make that happen. And then four hours later, when they show up at the water plant, that water engineer is there for them to talk to. But here's the thing. When they tell that water engineer, hey, we'll be back with your generator tomorrow, right? And they don't show up the next day with that generator, bad things happen. And this is, this, is the way the this is exactly where the magic happens. Their actions have second and third order effects. Their actions have consequences or the lack of actions, just like in real life. The reason why we do civil military operations in, in, in real life is that um, humans operate on Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with, with the bottom is what? What's the bottom need, basic need, for humans, for Maslow's hierarchy of need? Air. Air? It's like physical safety. Phys like it said, well, people get people always think it's like uh, the biological need of air. The security is usually the one. It's really Wi-Fi. We all know that, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's Wi-Fi. It's, it's really Wi-Fi. But no, it's really sec it's security first, and then it goes up to self-actualization at the top, right? right. However, when human when um, people don't have their needs met, they hold grievances. If the government or the community cannot. Uh, uh, Accomplish their grievances, bad things happen. So if Al Qaeda, if there's a disaster and they don't have food and they don't have water and they don't have security, they're going to grab onto the nearest thing to them. And if Al Qaeda rolls up with boxes full of food and armed guards and a law and order, they're going to fall in with them and then work for them. And that's historically proven with with, with um, um, those situations. So what we do is we work with our go those governments to decrease those civil vulnerabilities and mitigate them. And this training does exactly that. If the soldiers do not execute that, those tasks, bad things happen and they have to deal with those consequences which doesn't make things good for them. Alright, so those are the basic ideas of, of how we do our training. Now I'm going to explain how I designed the, the, the the training situations I did for my soldiers, right? Rule number one is set the rules, right? You always need the rules so we know what's happening. In our in the Army training, our <coughs> weapons have blank adapters on them. So they're not actually shooting real bullets. And I always have to remind, hey soldier, your weapon has a blank adapter on it. We're not really in war. Like this is, um, uh, it could be safe in what we do, right? Um, you can't just go up and punch that guy in the face. You have to say you're going to do it. These are real soldiers. This is your brother in arms. You can't just do that. So you always have to manage your expectations um, in that. Re real bullets shooting tr during training does not end well. There is a time and place for that, but not when you're live action role playing and doing scenario based training. So you have to set a structure. You have to set safety. Um, we all want to. Uh, Sad statistic is last month more soldiers died in training than in war, right? And that's usually the case. Um, but because what we do is inherently dangerous, but we have to make sure we follow the risk procedures. This is some uh, excellent uh, mobile force protection course out in North Carolina where we do evasive driving, we pit cars, we crash into each other, we, we do dead driver drills where we're going 40 miles an hour and we have to pull the person out of the driver's seat and take control of the car while driving and people are shooting at you with paintballs, very fun. I highly <laughs> recommend it. Um, but you have to be safe in doing that. And there's a reason why the Army doesn't conduct that training. We have to go to a contractor to do that, right? Um, so that's the number one. Two, build a world. You gotta frame it in location, give it boundaries so that they know where they are at all times. So sometimes our training areas blend and sometimes other people step into our training area or we step on other people, we have to ensure that they understand what are the boundaries and who's playing and who's not. You gotta build a story and make it deeper than you ever expected so that people can think critically and uh, achieve their goals. If you just fluff it up and give you the basic uh, top 
it doesn't do anything for them. You need to then to be able to reap a uh, different, different level. In this training right here, we designed a fake deployment to Papua New Guinea, and there, this guy is conducting an equipment handover ceremony to the Ministry of Defense. Um, during this event, they were able to talk to the civilians to get really great information about their disaster programs, and also there was uh, counterintelligence officers that took their opportunity to get information from my soldiers as well. Right, so that's a great training opportunity. Mm -hmm. Hey, remember that girl with the really short skirt that you were talking to all nice? She took all your information, and who does she work for? You don't know, do you? Well, now you know, and now it's half the battle, right? Kids, the, kids these days don't know that reference, by the way. I got it. Yeah. Uh, but, all right, but uh, you have to set that framing and give that story. Um, the next thing is, you have to have support for what you do. No matter what you do, um, you need people to run it, and LARPs that could get really expensive, and you need volunteers, and you need all this complicated stuff. In our exercise, we have extensive support. We have site managers. We have the students themselves. We have small group instructors, which manage the students, and they're like the overall person who gives the students, you are able to deploy to achieve our nation's objectives abroad, or you go back to your basic branch, right? Um, we have the environment, we have facilities, we have other role players who need to be trained. Uh, and they need all their rules as well. And then you have bad guys who are actually um, other soldiers playing as the enemy. And then we have all these props. But you need to manage all of these things effectively to create your desired world. Um, if you don't have a generator there and you're talking about a generator, people have to do a lot more uh, mental mental backflips to get to where, where they need to be. So trying to make it as real as possible uh, with, within your budget makes sense. And that's what we do. Um, a key thing for our SGIs is that they're also mentors and evaluators. So they're the ones that lead the AAR process, the after action review process, the experiential learning model process, and things like that. Um, they're the ones that help soldiers better understand what they do. Our soldiers learn through trauma and repetition and we like to give them repetitive trauma. So we give them the opportunity to fail a lot, and then we have them understand what they did, understand the situation in which they did it, and then change that. Um, you have to give your players and the soldiers a mission, and hit play and let it go. Um, their purpose is gonna drive their innovation and ability to make decisions. If you lock them in a box and just tell them this is your boundaries, they're not gonna do anything. But you have to be able to be flexible to their needs um, within, within reason. It's really an, an art versus a science. Uh, if soldiers want to wear uniforms, let them wear uniforms. If they want to go somewhere else, let them go somewhere else, just as long as they've reached their training objectives or your objectives uh, as a LARP designer. Um, so talking about the experiential learning model, it's really based on self-reflection and the internal evaluation of that person, and that's when learning occurs. After the small scenarios that we do in our training, we always have an after action review where we go through the student and ask them very important questions. What was your mission? What happened? No, no, what was your mission? What was supposed to happen? What happened? Why do you think that is? Right? And they're able to talk through all their reasons, um, which gives you lessons that you learn. You collect those lessons, and then you adapt your process later on, and the soldiers, most importantly, understand their, their internal methods and can use what they garner in future instances. We tell our soldiers they'll never see this exact scenario again in real life, exactly the way it is, but they will absolutely 100% see little snippets of it throughout their entire process, and you, if you put them all together, um, you, you get to that. So back to our story about the captain bleeding to death on the side of the road and the driver who's frozen in fear. Uh, the gunner said specifically that he was pulling security, driver, go check on the guy. But the driver said, I cannot, I'm driving. Does that make any sense? No. Right? It doesn't make any sense. Right? And I know it doesn't make any sense, right? So the other vehicle saw what happened, they came back around, and the soldier got out. And what did he say? What happened, yeah. right? Yeah. And then the, 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 the gunner says, the, the team leader just fell out of the truck. Like, I think he's hit. So they go up to him, and then they put their hands on his chest, and he's bleeding from his left uh, torso, 
um, this and that, and then they patch them up, throw them in the vehicle, and move out. So we get to our a after action review process, and we say, we did thing, what was the mission, blah, blah, what happened? And they said, um, the driver, I said, why didn't you help, why, what, what were you doing when the guy was bleeding to death? And the, the gunner asked him, what, what did you do? Why didn't you do anything? And he said, I couldn't, I was driving. And like, what the hell does that mean? Like, it doesn't mean anything. Uh, you were just holding the steering wheel. And the driver's like, yeah, I know, because that was my role. <laughs> and I said, what was that, that captain doing while you were holding on the steering wheel? And he's like, he was bleeding to death. Right. And let me ask you a question, soldier. Would you do that in real life? And you know what he said? No. <laughs> and I said, why are you wasting my goddamn time? <laughs> right? I'm here to train you to the best of your ability. I'm here to see what you would do in the situations that I put you in. And that really happened in real time. If you don't do what you're going to do in real life, I can't judge you. All I know is that you were scared to do something because you thought you had a role of a driver or some shit. Like, <laughs> like, that's just crazy. So I need you to focus. I need you to get in the game and just do what you're supposed to do in real life so I could evaluate your task, right? And then someone else says, but that wouldn't happen in real life. What? And I said, oh, really? And then that's when, I, I, didn't, I was going to say, oh, really? I didn't get to that point. That's when all the other students were like, what the hell are you talking about? And then it's like, well, you wouldn't stop. And then they said, the team leader said stop. You stop in real life. That's what happens, right? And they all had this, they started eating each other. And I was like, all right, time out. I said, what happened? Not what we think happened and everything like that. What happened? The guy grabbed his arm, grabbed his body, said he was bleeding, told him to stop, and fell the truck. That's what you need to respond to. Not, oh, that wouldn't happen in real life. Because guess what? That's exactly what happened in real life in my deployment to one of our soldiers. And that's why I put it in uh, the, the game. I mean, in the training, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, it's just a game fucker. Right, so I put it in, I put it in the game. And what happened is, what they were disconnecting was that we did our mission in the training center and we were driving back, so they disassociated that training with this training. I never stopped the game, right? I never stopped the training. They, um, but they were playing the game in their head and that's what, you want, that's what you want to prevent. You want to get them to act like they would in real life. You want to get them to be who they really are and see what they, they really can do. We want them to make it real. Um, uh, that's what we, we try to do to the best of our ability. All right, so this is me and during my training where I'm, uh, I'm with three soldiers, right? That, that's not my soldier. I had another soldier who was a cool guy up with me. And then the explosion goes off in our training, and they take out my soldier and replace him with this guy who's all covered in blood. And I'm like, oh, damn it. Right? And then we have to do our, our, our life-saving training on them and providing security. Right? So I did exactly what I would do in real life. And um, they said we did really well, and I, I was signed. But this guy right here is my team sergeant, and um, we were deployed together in Sri Lanka for nine months. And I, because of this training, I trusted this man with my life. Mm -hmm. We were in the middle of a classroom before we even got to this part. And he's like, okay, this is how you dress a wound that's in the, uh, a hard-to-reach place, like this, this pocket right here. And what he does is throws me on the ground, straddles me, grabs a ball of gauze, and jams it as hard as he could into my armpit. Mm -hmm. And it hurts so bad. But I know that if that happened in real life, this guy would do it without question. Right? So that's the type of real world role playing, real world training that tr put my trust in him to even a greater extent. Okay. Good. I know most people here. Um, before I get started, my name is Ryan. How many veterans do I have in the room? Right over there. All right. Um, that makes this, this easy. Yeah. Uh, can, everybody read, can everybody read the slide? Yes. There's a reason why I ask you if you can read the slide. But before I get started, I'm going to talk about violence. I know most of the people. Um, there might be triggers you might not expect because basically what I'm talking about is I'm talking about violence and narrative and where violence fits in the narrative and particularly when you have military violence, organized violence, how that works and how you can use it in the story. Um, so my disclaimer is realize that if you have been the victim of violence in your life, uh, just be aware that we are going to be talking about violence. Uh, I don't normally sit down, but we'll, 
We'll see if we can keep me seated. I might try and escape. I promise I'll come back. Um, but I'm going to stop talking for a little bit. Um, how many people here have ever read Tim O'Brien's How to Tell a True War Story? Okay. Uh, we're going to try it. So how many people ever played the game uh, Two Truths and a Lie? More people? We're going to reverse this. I got two lies and one truth. All right? So I'm going to give you three war stories. I'm not going to say anything because people will start trying to read me. So I'm just going to put them up on there, and then we'll get a nod when we're ready to move on. So everybody kind of look me down, stare me down when we're ready to move on. Are we good All with right. that? Okay. Then we'll move through. So here, here's the number one. Stare down. Here is number two. Here is number three. All right, so who here thinks that number one is a true story? Who here thinks that number two is a true story? Who here thinks that number three is a true story? My best friend Steve was stationed with me in Austin, Oklahoma. Steve did, was my best friend. We used to drink gin. However, Steve drowned in a swimming pool during crew rest. He was drinking. Him and his crew had a contest to see who could hold their breasts the longest and after a bottle of gin, Steve won. <laughs> his name was Steve Hatton, United States Air Force Academy, class of 2001. <laughs> my buddy, this is one of my first flights in Afghanistan in the MC-12. First example of where we actually did a live hit with a Hellfire missile. Um, however, we did not do it. We were looking at the guy one day as the sun, after the sun went down, and we remember he looked at me and he told me the story. Uh, and he said, and he looked at me, his question was, what would you do out here? This was in 2011. We're still there, but we're, we wound down significantly. And he told me the story and said, I don't have an answer. This is why I will never win the war. And then the next day, the kid, guy was walking away from a chick cut's birthday party to go take a phone call, and we blew him up. So that's the way it's fault. Option three. That's a tabby and that's a calico. I have kittens here. Because what was happening, I'm there's no way I'm sitting down this entire story. So there I am, out of, I'm in Kuwait. I'm the aircraft commander of a C-5. A C-5 is a big cargo plane that nose comes up in front. When you fly that, you have a crew of dozens of people. Uh, and you don't really know everything. We have a bunk room. We actually have a bedroom with three beds that you can go back and take a nap. Because you've got 24 hours that you're going to be on this airplane. So the trick is, when you've been on the plane for a while, when you're passing 10,000 feet, you can take off your seatbelt, right? That's when you can go to bed. So I'm in charge of this, and I'm like, hey, do you want to go to bed to the other pilot? There's three pilots. Do you want to go to bed? They're like, no, I'm up. I'm like, all right, I'm going to bed. And as I go to bed, I hear a commotion. And everybody on this airplane goes down the stairs. <laughs> and it wasn't until two hours later, another thing about the C-5, the bathroom is in the back of the plane. And you, can't, you have to go into the cargo compartment walk through the concargo department, come back up to go to the bathroom. So the first thing I want to do after I get done sleeping is I want to go to the bathroom. And as I go there, I'm putting on my boots, and you have to put on your headset to go down there because you need noise protection in case all of a sudden the airplane depressurizes because your headset's going to magically save you. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's the rule. I didn't make it. So we're about to go downstairs. And my friend John, he turns around. He's like, don't go down there. I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, don't go down there. There's a cat. <laughs> and I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? There's a cat down there. And this guy has a form that he's filled out, a safety report, an official Air Force form that he has detailed a vicious wildlife attack that happened downstairs. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Because it wasn't until later that I walked down and saw the blood on the floor that I believed the narrative that was written on the floor, on the form. And this is what happened. And to picture this, has anybody ever seen Alien? Not the second one with the Marine, the first one. That's an Air Force movie, by the way. Um, the, the cargo compartment of the C-5 doesn't have any of the noise absorbing stuff or the upholstery, so it's just like the skin of the airplane, the beads and all the cables and wires, the flickering lights, and we have vacuum wrapped cargo everywhere, so the pallets, so it looks like a scene from Aliens. And what happened is, when you pass 10,000 feet, the scanner, who's a guy who walks around and tells you the status of the airplane, goes down and comes on an aircom and says one thing, 
we have a cat down here. <laughs> and when he says we have a cat down here, everybody there all of a sudden says, I'm going down there. <laughs> I have no idea what they're going to do. I asked them, what were you thinking? <laughs> like, there's a cat. What, are you, you going to pet the cat? <laughs> Are you going like, he, is this going to be your cat now? I'm like, <laughs> what, what, what is going through your, because we never, we, air crew train, like the Southwest plane, when that just had the thing, air crew train for every eventuality, have a checklist that covers everything, so from a loss of engine, to a sick passenger, <laughs> to the bathroom not working, but nowhere in this checklist do they say, I really saw a cat, <laughs> right? So I go, so we go downstairs and the entire crew goes down and what they had forgotten is they, they thought they were hunting the cat. But in actuality, the cat was hunting them. <laughs> because what had happened is they go down, they forgot that, they, that nature made the cat stealthy and like gave it the advantage of climbing up top of the rafters and the cat would leap on them. And like one of them got scratched in the face <laughs> oh, and one of them got like cut, like the, the cat jabbed onto his hand, he had to fling it off. Ah. And they all ah. ran upstairs bleeding. <laughs> And then when we got to Germany, we tried to explain to them, there's a cat on board, don't open the door. <laughs> but they didn't know what we were talking about. They saw there was like a typo in the form, and they opened the door and the cat ran out. And we found out later, over a search of the plane, that the cat was defending her two kittens. Aww. Who were then adopted in Germany. Aww. And then we spent a week in Germany where the per diem is $119 a day at that point in time, so that was a $1,000 cat attack. <laughs> thank you, New York. Thank you, United States government. Did it delay you or anything? Oh yeah, one week. Like, one week. We're all bleeding and stuff. Like, they were bleeding. He had to get rabies shots. Wow. We didn't have the cats. He had to get rabies shots. This could be a rabbit cat. Nature's <laughs> <laughs> giving the cat more tools, right? Yeah. So my name is Ryan, and I'm going to talk about how you tell a true war story. Um, there's a couple things that I want to talk about here, and I had a teacher, uh, Donald Anderson, he graduated from Iowa's Creative Writing, he teaches Creative Writing at the Air Force Academy, and he always teaches Tim O'Brien, and now he's teaching a book by a guy named Philip Clay, who was a PR officer who wrote about uh, people coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan, Re sorry, not home, Redeployment is the name of it, it's called Redeployment, which I highly recommend. Um, but. When we're telling stories, how many people here have, uh, we already established, how many people here are veterans, we, we didn't have anybody, how, so I'm assuming that nobody here has actually done an act of deadly violence against another human being, and if you have, please don't, please don't tell me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, how many people have ran a game where you had somebody do an act of deadly violence against somebody? Okay. So let's think about that for a second. So we talk about, hey, how do we tell stories, how do we know, but there's other things, is the thing that I want you to realize when we go through this is when we're talking about how you tell a true war story is what is truth and what, what, and, and what elements do you want to tell, but also tell this is a difference between what you think the experience would be and, what, and that there's people who have had the actual experience. Um, so we're going to go over awareness of military service, but we're going to talk about what isn't, isn't realistic in events. Anybody here boffer? Okay, we're going to talk about that a little bit. Uh, we're going to talk about psychological stressors, which is only one of which is combat fatigue. And if I get any of you to do something, I will get you to kind of kill the, the PTSD written veteran, not because it isn't true, but because it might be overplayed slightly. Um, and then uh, the essential military story, which you tell in long form LARPs, which is hurry up and wait and how that can create a dramatic, dramatic space. And then open up with a question, which is why tell a military story? Um, disclaimer, everybody's experience in the military is personal. I don't know what, what, what Daniel very well, I don't know what his background is. Um, I always say that if you're talking to a military member from the U.S., you have to remember that we have a drastically different ops tempo from anybody in a different country. So you can talk to somebody who was in a European military and they can talk about their deployment to Afghanistan or Iraq. But if you're talking to your typical Army sergeant has been in for eight years to ten years, they're going to talk about their four deployments to Iraq mm -hmm. and how they've been going more, more than not. So uh, just remember, um, sometimes you'll have people relating experiences. It's like everybody's experience is unique and you have to respect that. And I intend to respect that here. Um, I have veterans as a share of the population. And as you see, uh, it peaked and is, and is steadily dropping. Um, we have never had as long a war as we are in right now. We are still at war. Uh, we've never had a smaller percentage of the population be at war. Uh, right now we're at 7%. It is beginning to steady out. 
is what studies are saying. Why did it drop? Anybody, why has it been dropping? Who's been dying? The GI generation. All the World War II veterans are dropping, right? It's going from like one third of everybody to about uh, five to seven percent, depending on the age group, is what we're looking at right now. So uh, racially skews slightly white. As the veterans get older, they get whiter, um, with increasing diversity, obviously. Um, as they try and make, as they, as they become and say, hey, we want to make it look more like the population. In terms of gender, it still skews very cis male, um, although that is also decreasing. Uh, we have very few binary statistics as a uh, very hot topic right now uh, in the military, if anybody's following the news with that note. Mm -hmm. um, and basically what I, uh, what I want to do with these slides is establish that military veterans do exist. You probably are going to run into a couple of them in your games, and they're not necessarily going to, you're not necessarily going to know if they are or aren't, and you're not necessarily going to be able, and you, you're not necessarily going to consider their experience because it's increasingly a rarity. Mm -hmm. I, I'm going to pick on somebody who I won't identify. They said, they, they said something, I drug, dragged them here. But something in the room is like, my parent is, was a veteran. I don't want to dismiss the experience of being a veteran's child, but it's a drastically different experience than being a veteran. I know from having my daughter that her, and also if you grow up, or if you are a uh, heterosexual cis male who's at a military base at the age of 20 in the military, the people there, the locals there, you're going to meet many um, cis female daughters of military veterans, and then you can ask them, so your dad was in the military, what does he do? And the answer is usually terrible. Like, it's like, you don't know, because you don't necessarily want to bring your work home. It's not like I want to tell my daughter, you know, exactly how the kill chain works or what a JTAC is or something. That's not kitchen talk, that's not kitchen table talk. Um, that's something that you want to kind of put. Uh, I bring up Phil Kay in Redeployment, I'll plug that book again, because he really nails the dichotomy of what we're talking about here with statistics, is that we have two ideas of veterans right now in our stories. I see, and I would postulate, this is me talking, I don't, this, is, this isn't me citing anything. The one idea of the veteran we have, who wants to take a stab at the one idea of the veteran? What, 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 what is big veteran? If I see a movie with a veteran, what, is it? Uh, what, what kind of movie is it? Oh, a type of movie? What movie? Um, what, what, kind of, what kind of veteran? When I say uh, veteran. Old, jaded. What war did they fight in? Oh, Vietnam. World War II. Vietnam. 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 And yeah, Korea. Korea. World War II. Korea is kind of like the one in the middle. That's the space yeah. in the middle, of, right? World War II. Most people can't tell me what the Korean War was about, but we know that there was a war in between Vietnam and. Uh, and it, it was a transitionary war. The war that they started in Korea was, was drastically different than the one they ended. We have World War II, which by and large, everybody fought him. Um, you had uh, total war, is what we would say. We didn't have much of a decent symmetry between the two forces. They were equally committed. And when they came back, they were fully supported with the GI Bill and, and, and life. And the other thing is, is they didn't have any sort of really uh, beyond print media at that point in time. You had limited radio media. And it was very corporate control. It wasn't anything like, they are not getting pictures that weren't released by the, that weren't screened by the Army. And when you have Vietnam, now you had a narrative developing. You had a Life magazine telling you about the war as it happened. And when you came back, you had another narrative coming back of the grizzled, disenfranchised veteran, which is a very true for some people, but not necessarily a universal experience. But those are the two things. We have Oliver Storm's going on the 4th of July, which, if I were to postulate, was kind of a construct of the late, early 1980s as the veterans of <coughs> Vietnam began to tell their stories. And then you have, you know, the idea of the greatest generation, also called the GI generation. Now we have a merger of those two. What I would argue when I go back to Philip Clay, and when you're telling these war stories, and I would like to reinforce, is that we are those two things informed, and that when you have an Iraq or Afghanistan who is moving into a narrative space, like a city like New York, or moving into LARP into a narrative space, they have to deal with those two narratives, which are very different. And the two things that I found personally, and when I read this book, and when I talked to other veterans, and I'd love to hear your opinion on it afterwards, uh, is that you want to be the same, but you also want to be acknowledged as different. Does that make sense? Like, I don't want anybody to treat me any differently as a veteran. I don't want to be like, well, uh, I'm going to have to come up. Are you going to be okay with this sort of thing? But at the same point in time, I will turn on you in an instant if you forget my military service. Does that make sense? And there's an irony there, and you have to be aware of that irony. And that really is what I would say defines what the 21st century American veteran experience. Um, I talked about that a lot. 
Um, veterans do, the other thing that I would like to touch on is veterans do not have a monopoly on violent experiences, particularly if you're telling a LARP uh, about uh, <coughs> uh, violence, with, domestic violence. Uh, by that I don't just mean domestic violence as in violence within the home, but domestic as in police violence within the country or any other element like that. Um, so I want to touch on some of those differences and say, when do I move from a story about violence, which have, have particular considerations, I think we generally have become, as a LARP community, uh, better about using violence in our narrative to this is military violence, which is treated differently. Because I would not, without careful consideration, have a narrative in a LARP right now focused on, one, on spousal abuse. That's something that I'd be like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Mm -hmm. This isn't something I just throw in there in your character background. We, we've learned that. Mm -hmm. However, at the same point in time, we do not hesitate to say, um, you fought in this battle. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's just something we do automatically. We, we, and, and why do we do that? We don't understand the difference necessarily. Let's talk about the differences. The first difference is there's much more deadly firepower. Okay? You are very unlikely in war to be injured twice. Severely injured twice. Why? Because generally, if you're that injured, it's one and done. So um, it's not like uh, somebody is hitting you with a fist, or somebody is, uh, you know, uh, physically restraining you. It is you are being exploded, shot at, burned. This is something that is going to kill you. So it's not something. So it is a single point in your life um, that you experience it, um, and the, because of firepower, so much more deadly. Um, it's professionalized, right? You have an expectation of violence. You have training. It's less foreign context. If anybody wants to write a book down to read about the expectation of violence, I have very complex feelings on this book. Please take everything with a grain of salt. But his name is S.L.A. Marshall, and the book is called On Killing. He wrote in Vietnam. You have read Grossman. it. What? Oh, that, Grossman. No, no, Grossman. But that wasn't Grossman. Grossman's On Killing. Grossman's On Killing. Um, S.L.A. Grossman is On Killing. S.L.A. Marshall is... Oh, Dan, now I got the yeah, Google, Google it for me. Thank you. <laughs> so what, what, S L A Marshall. S L A Marshall. What's the name of his book? S L A. S L A Marshall, and he wrote about the psychology of soldiers. This is where we get. Anybody ever hear the double tap? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the double tap, which is looks like you're going to, which is right now triple tap, two and three in the chest and one in the head. Mm -hmm. The idea is that you need to train soldiers to shoot at human-shaped targets. This came from that. Mm -hmm. He said that if I were had people, his theory is that the reason, the only way that you can explain with, the, with everybody having machine guns and lethality rates in combat is that soldiers aren't actually trying to kill anybody. That was his thesis. <laughs> Take it with a grain of salt. But he said that we need to train on human-shaped targets and that sort of thing so that people will shoot at a human-shaped target as opposed to I'm going to shoot at a round target with a bullseye in the middle, qualify expert, and then when I'm shooting at a human-shaped target, I'm going to deliberately miss. Mm -hmm. Did you get the... Uh, I don't, I see a lot of books, but like, it's, I, he wrote about Vietnam and all that stuff. Yeah, at SLA Marshall. But I think he was the one that, that I'm the, sure it was Marshall. Like, yeah, you shoot at, yeah. we shoot at silhouettes now, yeah. we don't shoot at targets mm -hmm. for a reason. Yeah. Because, in so like Civil War specifically, people, you know, they were aiming to miss. In the Civil War, he was telling you what he was doing, yeah. They were aiming to miss. Um, symmetric, and then the other thing that we look at, at uh, I always caveat when I talk about symmetric that there's no, that this day age, there's no such thing as symmetric warfare. But when I say symmetric, what I'm saying is that two groups are equally involved in the combat. It's really hard for me to describe a, a thing of, of symmetric warfare. It's much easier for me to describe asymmetry. If I am in an Afghan village um, that the United States is rolling up on, I'm totally engaged. Everybody I know is engaged in that fight. Right? That is my, everybody I know lives there, that my entire group is engaged in that fight. Whereas in asymmetric, I have a much, the United States, not every dollar, not every person in the United States is engaged in that fight. So there's an asymmetry. And the largest part of the asymmetry is a locale, I, I would argue, people would differ around me. It's a locale in which the violence occurs. Um, these are some of the differences I could expect, particularly for an American veteran. We haven't had uh, a war on American soil in, yeah, right. Well, it depends on how you define it. I would say since we since since uh, the end of the, uh, the the since the West was closed in 1890 is when I would I would call it that. But like I said, knock on wood. Um, so, so military violence is something foreign to our civilian population. 
Uh, we get look at the attack of 9/11. The part of the reason that was so shocking is that that doesn't happen, here, mm -hmm. right? That was that was something. That's an, uh, that's an example of hey, and people are traumatized by it. It'd be very difficult to come to New York, have a convention in New York City, and run a 9/11 arm. Mm -hmm. You'd have to have some. You'd have to have some guts to do that one, right? Um, particularly if you're not from New York. But that's an example of hey, how the, the, when we start shifting this, people are like that's military violence does not occur here, right? Um, so these are some elements that you have to consider. Uh, what are some similarities? Uh, let's deconstruct. In both cases, you have trauma. You have an attacker and the injured. The violence is something. Uh, violence done to the human body. In the end, if I, uh, the, if the severity is the same, it doesn't matter who shot you. Where the, the bullet that shot you to you, the end effect is you've been shot. And the relationship between that trauma doesn't necessarily change if one side puts on a uniform or feels a uniform on. Um, and the the idea of what is normal with that is that you're putting yourself in a context, um, and I think that you can relate this to different forms of violence. When you do a narrative with the military, you're saying, what is normal violence? And when you have normal violence, you have to say, how do I come out and what is my new normal? And I think that when we start talking about uh, continuing trauma or trauma outside the military context, really what you have to say is, when you're in the military, not only is combat one thing that's normal, but there's a lot of normalized experiences. Everybody, you don't need to learn anybody's name. Military people are notoriously bad at learning people's name. Why is that? Because so all wear name tags? We all wear name tags. I don't need to know. I'm like, oh, that's, that's going over there. Right? There we go. Um, I, was in a, I, if you're, I was in a squadron, a mixed squadron between cargo and fighter, uh, fighter guys. If you know any fighter guys, what do they go by? They go by their call sign. I knew Jammer. <coughs> I think his wife called him Jammer. <laughs> I'm like, and then his like his name, his real name was Wesley, and that made sense because you know, no one would be ever be afraid of the dread fighter pilot Wesley. So. <laughs> uh, but we, this is an example. What's normal? How do you go from that? How do you go to a point um, where you're evaluated, like your evaluation when you move? And a lot of those things that if you want to tell a military story, you have to consider leaving the military, you are going to a completely foreign environment to you now because everything was kind of regimented and taking care of you so that you could have a more normal experience when you get into, when you're deployed to a foreign area. Um, all these things make military war stories inherently problematic, and I'm not saying no saying, but that's some of the things that you have to consider. Um, here's some things that you might not realize. Um, and when I talk about this, how many people here, here's a good one, how many people here have seen Star Wars? Okay. Who are the good guys in Star Wars? Yeah. The Rebels. The Rebels. Who are the bad guys in Star Wars? The Empire. Let's talk about the Empire for a little bit. <laughs> what is the Empire? How do we know? Can somebody give me a defining trait? A stormtrooper. What do they look like? Armored faceless. They're all armored. They all look the same. They're all wearing uniforms. They're all wear bearing assault rifles, right? Mm -hmm. All right. So, how many people here in a LARP have ever used uniform, faceless, unidentified mobs as their villains? Not in a LARP, but yeah. But in a LARP. Yes. Is it right or wrong? And this is not value adjustment. Is it right or wrong to use a slur to dehumanize somebody you intend to kill? This is an easy question. Is it right or wrong to do that? To use a slur to dehumanize somebody? I mean, no. it, it, it is wrong. This is not a question. It's an easy question. I'm not afraid to trick you. I mean, it's a psych. But what happened? But I, now I have a question. How many soldiers do you think have used a slur right. when they were in that context to describe somebody they intend to kill? I will tell you, I'll do it. It's something that happened. How many people here have ever had dead bodies in the alarm? How many people here have ever had to move a dead body or deal with a dead body? In real life. Oh, no. In real life. It's fucked up, ain't it? Yeah. It's, it's fucked up. It smells. Here's another one. How many people here have ever been on the wrong side of a news story, like a really bad news story? In real life? In real life. Okay. In real life. Have you ever been on the wrong side? Let me tell you how every news story, whenever there's violence, we just had one, and I don't want to politicize this too much, but we just had a, a terrible, terrible incident. Um, disclaimer, American Jew right now. In Israel, uh, with 60 Palestinians. I don't want to get into that, but we all have a narrative on that. I'm going to tell you, every time, every time that there is violence, there are two sides. There's a side that won, 
and inflicted the violence, and there's a side that has nothing to do but collect the dead bodies and talk to reporters. I'm not justifying or anything, but just realize that. Because I know that I have seen reports on things that I have been a part of that were 100% inaccurate simply because what am I going to, and I can't blame them. They just got blown the fuck off. Pardon me. What are they going to do? They're going to say, look how terrible this is, and everything that they have is terrible. But they're only going to show you the terrible side of the story because they're mourning their dead. And I can't be expected that they're going to be give you a fair and unbiased account of what just happened. Something from the sky just blew up this, blew up this home. These are the dead people. And you don't know what was going on in that home or how long it took before somebody decided to do that. I'm not even saying that they're staging or lying. That's a different story. I'm saying that the perceptions are different and you only ever get one side of the story. Why? Because the other side is, class is debriefed, classified, filed away. And then by the time all that happens, the story's already happened. We got like two minutes. All right. Uh, so you want to figure out, hey, these are experiences that some of the people that, you're, that veterans that you have are doing. What is realistic in Galar? This is what you do right. If you have mass combat with minimal rules, you're going to be able to simulate some elements of warfare. The biggest thing that you're going to get is you're going to get chaos and perceived stress. Okay? Um, I use perceived stress because it's a thing. Um, real world tac tactics do work. If you ever see Pippin, they actually have a song about that. I'm like, no, those are real words. They just didn't make something like, uh, what's his name? To just make them up. Uh, and the duration of violence is often relatively realistic because you don't really have pitched long term civil war battles anymore. Uh, violence happens in spurts. And if you have a long term battle, it's going to happen generally in spurts. Things that are fun in war games that you're doing right that aren't realistic, hit points are much more fun than actual wounds. <laughs> It's, not, it's nice. Um, and if you have more than a few dozen people on either side, particularly in a buffer LARP, you're probably not simulating modern combat at this point in time simply because the difficulties of simulating small arms fire. Uh, it's something that, that's, that's difficult to do. Uh, I'll finish up with this. Uh, here's some of the stressors I won't talk to you because we're running out of time, but the essential war story, if you've ever been deployed, backing up on this, the number one thing that you're doing most of the time is waiting, right? Hurry up and wait. Get to this point. It's a giant logistics problem. Move over here and wait. All right, you wait. All right, go over there, eat something and wait. All right, go have a cigarette. Well, everybody smokes. Have a cigarette and wait. Why? Because what else are you going to do? Right? You don't have internet. Right? You don't have Wi-Fi most of the time. So you have to hurry up and wait. That's dramatic space because you know that something's coming. You know that, hey, go, go hurry up and wait over here. You need to hurry up and wait over here to get your armor. You have to hurry up and wait over here while they're passing out the ammunition at the armory. All these things are hurry up and wait stories. One of the things that I would say, if you're going to try and do a military thing, focus on the psychology. If you know what's coming, you're preparing for what's coming, but you don't know how it's going to go, and you're going to have that chaos. Uh, I have time. Got like a minute. So this is my open question to you guys. Why do we even want to tell a war story? I probably don't have time to answer that one, but I, that's one. why would you? I know why I would want to tell a war story. But my question to you guys is, why do you? Why would you want to tell a war story? Um, my oldest son is 21, and we've been at war his entire life. Um, war has been a perpetual part of our current and past history as like a race as far back as we can go. And so it seems like if you're exploring who we could be in different scenarios and understanding high-stress situations, etc., that's a powerful thing to include. It's kind of thing. It's easy <laughs> plot. Yeah. So real world war, war stories, they're so much better than anything Hollywood has ever created. Without question. The things that soldiers do and the things that happen to people, whether by luck or by chance, it's just is it, is just better than fiction, you know. Um, and that's why a lot of people take take examples of real life and turn it into fiction. As veterans, how do you feel about the practice of people describing some stuff that happened at a LARP as a war story? <clears throat> well, I mean, if, 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 I don't have any problem with it. I mean, like, if, if, it's a, if it's a story about that was actually that they had a fight and they were telling it, you know, that this is just re going well, what just happened in the vampire fight they had or whatever, yeah, that's an appropriate term, but, uh, 
uh, you know, everybody has their own opinions on that. I personally have no problem with it. Um, I think I go back to the dichotomy. I want to be exactly the same as everyone else, but damn you for forgetting. So it's probably not in itself problem, problematic. It's problematic if there's other el If you have another element, I'm looking for something to jump on, I'll jump on that. Does that make sense? <laughs> Like that, 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 that's not something that, that, that's just my personal experience. There are people, the biggest thing that I would know in the veterans community and that I talk about that's really the hot trigger is patches. Mm -hmm. Some patches, some patches mean nothing, and some patches mean a lot. Yeah, and I don't want to give my comment on, on that, you know, about, you know, recognize me but forget me, that type of thing. Uh, you know, for me, just my personal opinion is the victimhood really got shot up there that all soldiers are broken, broken uh, when they come back from war. Uh, no, we are not broken, but yes, we need additional stuff because we are forever changed. You know, mm -hmm. bottom line is, no matter anybody in here, if they hear a loud noise, a car backfiring, whatever, it reminds them of maybe a car backfiring or something like that. But, uh, you know, they didn't... That's because we haven't been exposed to 2,000 pounds of TNT exploding 100 feet from your, your, your bunk, right? It's just a fact of that people change in war, and that can bring that carries back home. Uh, but it doesn't mean that we're broken. Some people do need help, some people don't. It's just, it's just, to follow up with that, when he says help, that not it's necessarily like, like a, that's not necessarily like psychological help. That could be like <laughs> help adjusting. I have a bit highly technical, well trained skill that is not applicable. States, right? So the one thing that I would warn you about, if you say, hey, what, what would set me off? The thing that always gets me hair up on the back of my neck is when somebody says, thank you for your service. Mm -hmm. Because if thank you for your service comes, like if I'm applying for a job, thank you for your service means thank you for your service, but I'm not hiring you for the job because I want to go with that guy. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your service. Is, do, make sure that is not lip service. Say nothing. That's cool. I'm not looking for a thank you. But make sure that you know you wait and say you have something to offer, even if it's just genuine like emotional labor or sympathy right there, as opposed to thank you for your service so I can say I thank you better. Some people care some. I had a question about um, how your your opinion as veterans. How do you feel about people playing uh, as their IC characters playing military veterans or playing active duty uh, people who are, who are in the military? Do you find, um, well, I'll just say, do you have an opinion about that? Um, I, like, you know, don't watch a movie that has soldiers in it with me, because I'm, you know, like, uh, there's some things that movie people do that's so ridiculous, and LARPers is, is probably the same way. So, for example, a great example is Fear the Walking Dead, episode, I don't know, eight, or something like that. Zombies are coming, everybody's trying to escape this little military compound, and they take a hot moment to have one of the soldiers uh, insinuate sexual violence on one of the civilians out of the fucking blue. Yeah. And to me, that's just so insane. But to the writer, it was, this is completely appropriate. You know, That's why I don't have a problem. But people like, if the people would pretend to be a soldier or like, you know, LARPing active duty soldier or that I just experienced combat, that's completely fine as long as they don't... Um, like, yeah, soldiers are people too, so they do bad things. But when you take it to the level of uh, portraying as something so grand that, like, the Fear of the Walking Dead example, this is a bad example, so I don't know. But, like, there's no problem with it because, you know, soldiers are people too. So you can be a soldier. And soldiers aren't all good, but uh, it's no problem with the role playing as well. You know what? Desperately to ask you about uh, tabletop role playing games, but I'm not sure how familiar you are with them. Um, Nathan Pella wrote a game called Carry, a game about war, in which it's almost a LARP. It's a company of soldiers in Vietnam. It's characters like this is your character, this is your thing, here's your objective. Um, it's a phenomenally good game. I believe it's loosely based off Tim O'Brien's book. Yeah, it is. Is he is he a veteran of Vietnam veteran himself? He's not, but as I understand, he you know, he was like interviewing and working with and saying, what can I do? How can I do this? I, I, so I'd be interested in your experience with that and the other is MASH which is about MASH. MASH I would say MASH is a different story because MASH is about a, a, a work yeah. of fiction. Yeah. Um, I would not write a story, I would not write a story, I have 
2,000 combat hours, no, 1,500, 1,700 combat hours over Afghanistan and Iraq. I would not write a, a game or a work of art for other people to consume that uh, was based on the Army experience on the ground. You know, I have to take that back. I actually don't know if he's a veteran. If he, my, my opinion on it is there is a lot of myth about Vietnam. Yeah. Oliver Stone is a Vietnam veteran, and he <coughs> got to say what Vietnam was. Right. And most people, when they say, what is Vietnam, it's informed by Oliver Stone. Um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's Oliver Stone. This is also the guy who did JFK. Yeah. Okay. So let's remember that. Um, I would have hesitation about somebody who is not in Vietnam writing an, a simulation of that. There are, I would say, there are technical aspects of it. Like if you want to do a technical like simulation of hey, what? How, how does an OB-10 Bronco driver do forward air control? You guys don't know what that means, mm -hmm. but I could do a simulation of that, um, which has changed in the last 40 years. But I knew OB-10 Bronco drivers. I, 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 I as a hobby and studied that part, so I could say, all right, here are some elements to simulate. I would still get a number of things wrong because I wasn't there doing the mission like that. A lot of anachronisms, probably. But I would feel, but to have an emotional experience on it, I, I am hesitant. I guess it's a little bit of follow up on the question you asked about, you know, if, if we were, as non-veterans, to sit down and like, all right, let's do this LARP, that might be a different experience. Um, but having a, a tabletop role-playing game to say, okay, how can I approach this subject with any devil, level of complexity or, aware, or, or awareness or, you know. I, I don't. Like to I make one? Sorry. Oh, no, to, like play one. Just, oh, to play one? To play one? play one or make one or... Because well, we're think, sitting here because yeah. we're, we are legitimately yeah. deeply interested mm -hmm. yeah. in this exact question. Yeah. And so finding a way to do that in a, a way that is conscious and respectful yeah. and nuanced. Um, you know? I would say just try, try and realize whether you're dealing with something first order a first order simula a first order simulation, which is second order, or a second order simulation, which is third order. If it's based on Tim O'Brien's uh, The Things They Carry, then make sure everybody's read The Things They Carry and say, we're not simulating Vietnam, we're simulating Tim O'Brien's mm -hmm. right. account of the Vietnam. Yeah, it, it and that would not, to me, be problematic. Yeah. But if you say, well, this is what Vietnam was like, I'm like, I can't tell you what Vietnam Every Vietnam vet knows exactly what Vietnam was like. The problem is that none of them agree. Yeah, that's so true. Right? Oh uh, I mean, more than anything else, they, they didn't have the normalizing effect that we have right now on social media. They, had, they were largely in isolation, dealing with print media mm. and mass market. And they were, and individual veterans had very strong voices. Tim O'Brien has a much stronger voice than Philip Clyde, right? You guys have never heard of Philip Clyde. Philip Clyde's fantastic. But, like, uh, that, that was how media is then. And now you have a lot, now you have ac access to a lot more accounts. Yeah. Um, so that's one thing I warn about there. Uh, I, I don't think I was, I was uh, clear with my, my question earlier as well. Um, you know, to, to me it seems like the, being a soldier is a very, as I said, a very personal experience for each one of you, and for each soldier. Um, it's also, I think, something that people who aren't veterans maybe can never understand because, like, I don't, I, I'll never understand what, it, what it's like to be in Iraq or, um, you know, to conduct uh, live warfare training and things like that. So, um, for me, it seems like, you know, when you get something that's so personal, it's, it could almost be appropriative to try to take that on, right? Because, like, if I walk into a LARP and I say, well, you know, I, you know, flew 12 combat missions and this and that, and it's like, but, you know, I could never do that, right? I never did that, and that's somebody's real experience. I, I mean, right? I think if, 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 it's always the purpose of it, right? If you want to, like, learn and, I, I say go for it, you know, mm -hmm. go, like, talk, talk to, if you want to learn about veterans and everything like that, read the books, talk to them, understand, try to understand them, and then you could go, Try to LARP it, LARP it, right? Um, or you could just watch a movie and just do what you see in the movie because it's fun, right? As long as you're not being disrespectful of people's service and everything like that, but you know, everybody, 
I was a vampire yesterday, trying to do my best to be a cool vampire. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, as long as you're respectful to the veterans and you just want to try to be it, you know, I, th I think there's no harm in that at all whatsoever, you know. And veterans will completely understand. The first thing you said was also, people will never understand. And that happens, you see that uh, used a lot in movies and things. Like, you'll never understand because it's just a fact. One of the most hard-hitting articles I ever read, and this is really rough to tell you guys because it's, the, it's the, the split between civilian and military. It's called The Pants Shitting Kindergartner. And this guy just writes how he's in the classroom full of all these other college students, but he just got back from, you know, literally hand-to-hand yeah. -hand fighting with the Taliban, right? Mm -hmm. And he just says, every time I talk to them, it's like I'm talking to a pants shitting kindergartner, mm -hmm. right? Um, it, it's just something, it's a, it's a burden that we have to carry, but that's fine. If you guys want to try and understand it, that's also fine. And we're here to help you guys do that and answer all your questions. I will answer any question you have about war, my opinion, and everything like that, so we can help people understand. I was even thinking about doing a LARP to show people what it's like to be a soldier deployed. And it's not fun. Often in LARP, we deconstruct identity and it becomes you know, complex to create a, a very simple scenario you know, this force and this force, which, you know, often in military conflict is, you know, pit those two things against each other. So I'm wondering, in terms of your own experiences, because it's been so contextualized in that, that format, you know, after coming out of that and sort of thinking about that and wrapping around in terms of designing LARPs, um, what, what changes do you have in terms of how you approach that and, and how do you, how do you uh, like, enter I, into that art form? The interesting thing to me and I think that the military, if you uh, treat military service as a form of identity, which is a controversial statement in itself, mm -hmm. it is a transformative identity. It's not something you start off at us. Mm -hmm. um, it could be, there is an argument based on demographics that there are many people who are born into the military. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Like you know that some, they are very likely to join the military, but generally it's a transformative experience. Um, and I would say you want elements, of, I'll give a, a personal example. I did a six month deployment that took me 12 months, which is not an uncommon experience. He's laughing Air Force six months, so I'm like, I can do that. Army I did 215s. Yeah, 215. So he's like, oh, there we go. Um, but that particular, that particular was 12, was 12 months. Um, uh, Air Force recruiter was right next door to the Army recruiter, is what I always say to that. But, <laughs> but he was out playing golf at that time, which should have been assigned to you. So, um, but you go and that experience of, okay, I have to leave, I have to, first off, the month before you deploy, two months before you deploy, your entire job is like leaving early and getting home late, getting ready to deploy. So then you can go there, and once you get there, your first week, because now they don't need to send you home at all, is you're going to sleep, right? It's like you're, you're doing all this stuff again. Just like you got your shots, you're my shot records right here, here get your shots again. And then when you come back, I came back and I got divorced right after I came back. And that's not an uncommon experience. Mm. If you tell me, hey, what kind of LARP do I want about the right of the military experience? Take people at different points in the military career, knock down right. Take the guy who just came back and got divorced. Take the guy who's on his second marriage. Take the guy who's on his second divorce. Take the guy who is like trying to make rank. Take the guy who just got in. Take the guy at MEPS before you look up what MEPS is, M-E-P-S and how, what happens if you get stuck in MEPS for a cup. I want to do a LARP that is two people, like four people at MEPS who are waiting for their, for their deferral, for all the forms to go through, who have nothing to do, who are 18 years old, who have nothing to do but join the military tomorrow. Oh, but they know if it's gonna be tomorrow or not. Mm. What would you do? You're 18 years old, you're away from home, what are you gonna do? <laughs> you're gonna bang, right? <laughs> they put you up in a hotel room. Buy some rooms. There you go. <laughs> lots, of stuff, lots of stuff to do. And then you take those, you would follow those through and look at different points and never approach downrange. Uh, don't ever approach uh, the deployment part and look at the effects of that one. That would be a That would be an amazing part. Look at somebody, look at people who are like, I can run you through the logistical process of getting somebody. What do you guys call in the Army when you're doing 15 months? You get, to get home two, twice a week. You get, two, you get two weeks. What is that called? Leave. The one in the middle. Oh, the one in the middle. You know what I'm talking about. The, oh, oh, you mean um, R&R. &R. Oh, yeah, call them R&R. &R. The R&R. &R. So you have R&R. &R. It says that the Army has to give you two weeks off um, 
and it's a logistical nightmare because until somebody gets back, you can't go. And everybody's always delayed, so there's waves. Mm -hmm. So one of my things was, so I, whenever I went to, to Bakram Air Base, is I would go and I would walk in and I would be like, I learned this because they all go to Kuwait and not uh, Al Udeed, and we wanted to go to Kuwait as air crew. So I go there and I'm like, I can bring 72 people to Kuwait right now. You have R&Rs, give me 72 R&Rs. They're out of here. But the logistical nightmare of making that happen meant that these guys are sitting on their bags mm -hmm. in like, uh, at, at the time they had gotten hard billets, but it was like you're in a tent sitting on your bag waiting for a plane to come pick you up. And you could be there for days. Mm -hmm. You could be there for days. And you have to be ready to go because you don't know when the plane's going to be there because it's broke. It's some, some jerk got mauled by a cat. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. So technically we are out of time, but are you two available to like talk and someone sees you? Yeah, yeah we're 100% available. Please. Awesome. We're going to talk right now. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank some are excellent and some are. T Hurt Locker is the worst, like description of military anything I've ever seen in my time. Versus like Band of Brothers, which is like near flawless. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So that's you just gotta understand that. There's another show FX called Over There. It was a very short miniseries where they mixed perfect depictions of military whatever with the worst. Mm -hmm. Of like, like, so for example, uh, they're on a patrol, they're in the back of a truck, they're driving down, they're talking about eating hamburgers and what they're going to do when they get back home. They stop, dude gets his leg blown off. Mm -hmm. Completely happens in real life. Then that guy is in the, in the, in getting surgery, and he's like, I don't need morphine. Oh, for <laughs> <laughs> so I need, Like, that's not even a, that's, that's <laughs> a thing. That's so, it's so insane. So like, just be wary of stuff that you hear from like, non-military people, because sometimes they have no idea.